Good morning. Earlier this summer, when we were traveling east to go to our annual General Assembly, I noticed we'd be driving past a small town in Iowa called Dyersburg. Now that town may not mean much to you unless you're both a movie fan and a baseball fan. Out of that town comes one of the best movies, in my opinion, that was ever made because it's a movie about baseball. But it also gives us that movie an iconic line that everybody seems to be familiar with. You may not have ever seen the movie, you may not care about baseball, but you've heard this line, if you build it, he will come. It's from the movie Field of Dreams. And there are other lines from other movies that are just as familiar where even if we can't remember the movie or the actor, we, we know the line and you'll hear people say it even. Like, oh Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Or, do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do you? Or, here's looking at you, kid. I bet most of you could remember the movies those three lines came from, but how about this one? A man's got to do what a man's got to do. That, that line is attributed to a movie that's older than I am, a 1953 Western titled Shane. And if you never saw the movie, when you hear that line, you still know what it means. You still know what it's referring to. It's referring to a man standing up and doing what's right, no matter what the consequences might be. Today, our study of Daniel brings us to Daniel 3, to an account that everybody has some familiarity with. It's the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Three men who stood up for their faith in the face of great adversity. Three men doing what a man's got to do. But there's so much more to this account than just a man's got to do what a man's got to do. In fact, I think there's a big problem for us if all we take from this account is that moral lesson a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And I'll show you that problem in a minute, but first, let me read you the text so we can talk about it. This is the word of the Lord, Daniel 3, verses 1 to 18. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and mal maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. 
So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, as you read that account, it really sounds like three men simply doing that which a man's got to do, no matter what the consequences but I want to suggest to you, if that's all it is, it, it really isn't much help, at, at least for me, and probably not for you. Because how many times have each of us had a moment where a man's got to do, and we simply didn't? For me personally, honestly, it's, it's too many times to count. And sadly, it's never really taken a fiery furnace to make me cave. It's usually something much less, like my own smoldering fears or my own fiery, selfish desires. As I read accounts like this, or accounts of various martyrs of the faith, I have a hard time imagining myself standing in their shoes, doing what they did, taking a stand, doing what was right, especially if that would involve doing it in the face of death. Deep down inside, I feel that my flesh, from, from experience, is very frail and weak. I fear I would be much more like Peter denying Jesus in the moment of trial rather than these men who stand firm in their faith. And I want to warn you that if you don't see your own weakness and vulnerabilities, you're in great danger. Remember how Peter saw himself? Do you, do you remember what he said? Jesus, no matter what these other jokers do, I'll be right by your side. I'll be standing firm because a man's got to do what a man's got to do and I am that man. That's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close. Within himself, Peter thought he had what it took, even if the other disciples didn't. But with Peter, if you remember, it didn't take a fiery furnace either, did it? It just took a servant girl asking some questions and Peter folded like a cheap suit. I don't even know the man. Anytime we think we can stand when others fail because we're the man who's going to do what a man's got to do, well, we better think again. Do you remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 12? So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Deep down inside, we, we all want to be Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego. But the warning from scripture is this, if we're depending on ourselves, depending on ourselves to be the man, depending on our own strength, we are more than likely gonna falter and fail rather than stand firm because when push comes to shove, our flesh is weak and it's pretty easy for us to rationalize and find excuses to not do what a man needs to do. Why did these three young men stand firm when Peter fell? Why do I so often falter and fail and cave in when these men stood strong? The answer to that question is, is actually summarized for us by Paul in two verses that we talked a lot about in the book of Romans as we got into the application section of the book. Do you remember these verses? They lead off the application section of how we should live life in light of the theology Paul taught us. Romans 12, 1 to 2, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, 
his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't conform to the world. When everyone else was bowing down and worshiping the false gods of Babylon, they refused and were literally willing to offer themselves as a living sacrifice. Daniel three seventeen to 18, do you remember what they said? Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What was it that made these three men willing to offer themselves as a living sacrifice? In a sense, the answer to that question is glaringly obvious. They had faith. They had an enormous faith that seems to go well beyond the mustard seed size faith that I so often have. It was a faith that transcended all the circumstances of life, and because of that, it transformed the way they thought about life. How do we get a faith like that? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is that our faith is a gift of God, a gift that God gives to us and measures out to us according to our need. In fact, listen to what Paul writes in Romans 12, 3. Immediately after he talks about offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, he says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Faith is measured out to us by God. It's a gift of God's grace. And we should trust that in the moment of need, God will give us the faith we need in the moment Jesus made that clear, Matthew 10, 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for you are to, what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. So on one hand, the first thing I want to say to you is don't lose sleep over what might happen when that day comes and you do find yourself standing in front of your own fiery furnace. But on the other hand, I want to tell you this. While faith is a gift of God, the scriptures also make it clear that it's a gift we are to nurture in our lives. We are to be built up in our faith. We see this in Paul's admonishment to Timothy about the gift of faith that's been given to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.6, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. The question is, how do we do that? How do we nurture our faith? How do we transform our own thinking so we don't conform and cave into the thinking of this world? How do we fan the gift of faith into flame, a flame that burns bright as we stand before our own fiery trials? Well, first we have to understand this. We should expect that our faith is going to be tested day in and day out. And if you're going to be tested, it helps a lot to know what's on the test, right? So you're prepared. And I think oftentimes we're oblivious to what's really on the test. We look at a passage like this and we think the test of faith is the fiery furnace. That's not the test at all. That's the final question on the exam. But it's not the test by itself. It's the final push. To the best of my knowledge, none of us have ever been placed before a fiery furnace. And hopefully never will. That's not the question. What are we going to do in front of the fiery furnace? The question's earlier. The main question of the test is much earlier. What are we going to do when the world tells us we're to bow down to its idols? The main question of the test is, will these three young men conform to the ways of the world and bow to its idols or will they stand firm in their faith? That's the question. The fiery furnace is just the final threat. Now that question that they face is a question we face day in and day out. We don't even think about it most of the time. Will we stand firm? Or will we conform to the world? Think what we see in the first six verses here of Daniel 3. It's kind of an amazing picture seemingly and quite possibly in response to the dream of the statue Nebuchadnezzar had remember in Daniel 2 
the statue with a head of gold and a chest of silver and a midsection of, of bronze and legs of iron that the stone struck and demolished. Do you remember that? Nebuchadnezzar goes and builds a statue, a 90 foot tall, dazzling statue. And unlike the statue in his dream that only had a head made of gold, his statue is solid gold from head to toe. It's almost as if Nebuchadnezzar is trying to counteract the dream and its meaning that was given to him in Daniel 2. Trying to say, there's not going to be any end to my kingdom. There's no sections to come after me. This is solid gold from beginning to end. There will be no end. There will be no after his kingdom. His kingdom would endure His glory would endure forever. That's what he's trying to say, I think, as he builds this statue. And the text doesn't make it clear to us what the identity of the statue is, what it represented, but we get a hint of it in in verse 14 and in some other places. Nebuchadnezzar says, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? Most likely, this statue was some kind of a representation of Nebuchadnezzar's God. But in that day, the gods that men set up were always wrapped up in the men who set them up. Notice that in verse 14, the phrase there, that I have set up. We see this phrase or something similar repeated in verses 1 to 3, in verse 5, in verse 7, in verse 12, in verse 15, in verse 18. And and it makes it clear that, that while this statue represented some god that was to be worshipped, Nebuchadnezzar was the force, the power behind that god. That's the way it always is with the false gods of this world. They're man-made. The idols that we so easily fall prey to and worship are all made by man and have no real power if you really stop and look at it. They hold out the promise of life to the fullest or death, depending whether we worship it or don't worship it, but they don't really have that power. In contrast to Daniel's confession that it was the God of heaven who set up kings and deposed them in in Daniel 2.21, the statue was Nebuchadnezzar's defiant declaration that as king he would set up the gods for his people to worship. He had the power to do that. When the orchestra started playing, everyone was to conform. Everyone was to bow to the image. And if they didn't bow, they would die. They would face death in a fiery furnace. Now, why did Nebuchadnezzar, why was he so insistent on this conformity? Well, remember, Nebuchadnezzar has conquered many different lands and cultures and countries, not just the Jews. Babylon had become filled with people from all over the world And they all had their own gods. And it's hard to rule over a divided kingdom with divided loyalties. So Nebuchadnezzar sought to make everyone conform. In effect, what he was saying was, you can worship your God, but on my command, when the music starts, you have to worship my gods too. They take precedence. We hear something really similar in our culture today, don't we? It's fine for us to have our private faith as long as we keep it within ourselves, within the walls of our own home, within the walls of the church. But in public, what we better conform. Don't bring your faith. Don't bring your views on abortion or marriage or anything else into the public square unless those views conform to the views of the culture. But can we really live that way? Can we really just go along to get along? Can we just be silent in the face of evil? Put yourself in the shoes of these three young men. They, they knew the Ten Commandments. They knew they were not to bow to any carved image. They weren't to worship anything other than the true and living God. The commandment clearly expressed God's will for how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were to live not just in Jerusalem, but anywhere they lived, including Babylon. 
These same commandments, well, they speak to us today, right? They tell us how God wants us to live. We're not to bow to idols. We're to worship God alone. We're to live in conformity to his will as expressed through his law rather than in conformity to the laws of the world around us. These three men knew that God had called them to obedience to his law. But obedience is always hard. But it's especially hard when you know there's a blazing, fiery furnace standing in front of you. When you're threatened with death, if your obedience puts you at odds with the culture. Standing before that blazing furnace, think how easy it would have been for them to say things like this. Well, it'll, it'll be okay to just bow down this one time. Certainly, God doesn't want us to die. But, or, or maybe this. The, the Babylonians, they, they don't understand our ways. They don't understand our God. We're going to go along to get along so we don't cause them any offense. We'll bow down because that will open the door for them to listen to us later. Or maybe we have a loving God. So look, we'll just bow this once and then we'll ask for forgiveness. Or maybe we'll be kneeling on the outside, but inside we'll be standing and worshiping the true God in our hearts and he'll understand. Think how easily we cave into the same pressure making those same kind of excuses, even without a blazing, fiery furnace in front of us. Think how often we think, well, it's wrong, but it's going to make me happy, and God wants me to be happy, so I'll go along. Or, I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to make waves. I'll just go along to get along, and I'll win them over with my love. Or, yes, I give in and conform, but God will love me anyway. We do it all the time. We can always find a way to rationalize our conformity, can't we? But these three men, they knew they couldn't live in conformity to Babylon and its ways. And they knew that because they remembered what the prophet Jeremiah had said as they went into exile. God made it clear how he wanted them to live there in Babylon. And it wasn't to go along to get along. Listen to what God said to them through, through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 4 to 7. Therefore says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. That would be these three young men. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare. In its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is how God wanted them to live in Babylon. They were to live according to God's commandments. They were to maintain their identity as the people of God. They were to increase in number even as they settled there and worked for the peace and prosperity of the city. These three young men, they were working for the peace and prosperity of the city. You see it in this passage. You see it at the end of Daniel 2 verse 49. They were put in charge of the province of Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. They were working for the good of the place where God had sent them. Now as high government officials though, imagine the immense pressure that they must have felt to go along to get along. We gotta keep our position. We gotta keep our place. But they couldn't do that because they knew their real place as they stood before God. In addition to telling these men to work for the peace and prosperity of the city, God also told them in Jeremiah 29 that they were to increase in number, not decrease. They weren't to assimilate and become like the Babylonians. They were to maintain their identity as the people of God, living according to God's law. The world is always going to try to get us to conform, to lose our distinct identity as God's chosen people. The world's really okay if we have our God as long as we're willing to bow to their God. 
The world's always trying to get us to bow down to its glittering idols that it's made. Idols that promise life if we do bow down and death if we don't. For some of us, the golden image that we think will give us life is maybe something like the respect and admiration of others. Young people here in the room, let me tell you, this pressure is going to be immense. If you haven't felt it already, you will. The pressure to fit in and be part of the crowd, even though being part of the in crowd would mean you keep quiet about your God. Maybe that you might disrespect your parents like the other kids do, or maybe that you don't keep yourself physically and mentally pure until marriage. Bow down to me, the image says, or I'll throw you into the fiery furnace of mockery and the ridicule of your peers. And too many young people cave in and don't stand firm, and too many adults cave in and don't stand firm because we want to fit in. This idolatry was described by C.S. Lewis as the allure of the inner ring. That is, the desire to be on the right side of an invisible line that divides the insiders from the outsiders. Indeed, the power of this idol is such that in the opinion of Lewis, of all the passions, the passion for us to be in the inner ring is most skillful in making a man who's not yet a very bad man do very bad things. And sadly... From too many times in my own life, I can attest to the truth of what Lewis is saying. I think many of you can probably attest to the truth of what Lewis is saying as well. You've done things you never imagined you would do because you wanted to be part of that inner ring. Too often we slip almost unthinkingly into a daily obedience to the demands of the idols of this world like everyone else worshiped there on the plains of Babylon that day. But not these three young men. When the music started, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down. They refused to conform. And because of that, they literally stood out from the crowd, didn't they? We're supposed to do that as the people of God. Knowing the test, knowing what's going to be on the test, it's a good first step to being prepared, but it's only a step. Knowing what's on the test doesn't really increase our faith, does it? It just helps us to know we need to have faith when the moment comes. We have to understand the immense pressure the world is going to place on us to conform to its ways. We have to understand that we do indeed live in the midst of two kingdoms that are in conflict, and as a result, every day, we are faced with a decision. Are we going to bow to the idols of this world or stand for that which we know is true and bow to the will of Christ our Lord alone? For us to be able to do that, we have to start by knowing what does Christ want from us? These men knew they were to obey the commandments. They knew they were to seek the prosperity of the city. They knew they were to seek to not assimilate and be assimilated into the culture. What does Jesus want from us? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, this is what he wants from us. This simple summary of the law, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If you're loving God with all your heart, if you're loving your neighbors yourself, you're fulfilling all the law of God. This is how Christ calls us to live, to stand out from the world around us. If we live that kind of life, we will be doing the will of Christ. And we will be living in a way that is in marked contrast to the world around us. But knowing how Christ wants us to live and being able to actually pull it off as a living sacrifice, well, that's two different things, right? So how do we fan into flame the gift of faith that we've been given in a way that will help us to live in conformity to the will of Christ rather than conformity to the world? To live in faith in a way that will help us to love God with all our heart, love our neighbors ourselves, rather than being lovers of self and money and the pleasures of this world. 
Well, first, we have to understand the character of the object of our faith. I want to submit to you that the object of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith wasn't simply religion. It wasn't simply a doctrine that was taught in Judaism. No, the object of their faith is very clear in this passage. The object of their faith is God. There's a big difference between having faith in our faith, faith in a set of precepts, and faith really in God. We're not called to have faith in our faith, a certain set of beliefs. We're called to put our faith entirely in God. That's what we see these three men do in Daniel 3, 17 to 18. They are trusting God completely. What verses 17 and 18 describe is, is really true faith. True faith that will give you the power to resist conformity to the ways of this world. Our God can, they said. He can deliver us. But if he does not, we will not bow down. Do you see what they had for God? What they had for God was an unconditional love, a love that didn't depend on what God did in that moment. It was a love that resulted in an unconditional faith, an unconditional faith that made them fireproof. Think what they're saying with that statement. We will serve and obey God no matter what he does. They were saying we're going to serve God simply for who he is, not for what he'll do for us. So many people today have an attitude like this. Well, I'll trust this God. I'll put my faith in this God. But he better come through for me. When I live a good life and I want something, God better deliver. If that's our attitude, are we really loving God simply for who he is? Or are we using and manipulating God just simply trying to get what we want from God? If our attitude is we're only going to love God if he comes through for us and does what we want him to do, then our hope isn't in God at all. Our hope is in that thing that God must do for us. Our hope's in our own agenda that we expect God to pull off for us. And that means the real God of our life is our agenda, not God. God's just a means to get the agenda. That means that we're bowing really to some idol that we've created in our minds. Some idol that we think will give us happiness and meaning. And many people who call themselves Christians are simply using God because they think God will bless them and get them ahead in this life. And it just doesn't work that way. If God's just a means to get our agenda, we'll never withstand the pressure to conform because as soon as God doesn't give us what, it, what we want, We'll go look for someone who will. But these three young men, they're different. They love God simply for who he is. Their love isn't contingent on what he'll do for them. It's simply based on who he is. And that makes them spiritually fireproof. Do you see what they knew about God? They knew that God had the power to rescue them from physical death. But they couldn't be positive that he would because they didn't know his will in that moment. But they trusted him no matter what. Because they knew that even if he didn't deliver them physically, God would rescue them through death. They are absolutely confident there in verse 18 that God will, or verse 17, that God will deliver them out of Nebuchadnezzar's hand, either in life or in death. They knew no matter what the flames might do to their body, their souls would be delivered from Nebuchadnezzar and kept safe with God for all of eternity. They knew that if they died in their faith, they would be safe, even in death. They knew that if they died, they'd wake up to something far more glorious than this life that they would wake up in the presence of a glorious God, and that meant that no matter what happened to them in the furnace, they would be safe forever, spiritually fireproof, even if God chose in the moment to not make them physically 
fireproof. And we'll talk about that more next week. But this is where the power to resist conformity really lies. It's knowing that because God loves you, no matter what happens in this life, there's a glorious eternal future that awaits you. And that's why to have a faith that will keep us from conforming to the ways of this world, we have to remind ourselves constantly of the great and precious promises that have been given to us. The book of Isaiah was written 200 years before these three young men would be taken into captivity. But in Isaiah 39, the prophet Isaiah tells King Hezekiah exactly what's going to happen in verse 5 down through, down through verse 7. He tells Hezekiah that his grandchildren are going to be taken off into captivity in Babylon along with things in the temple and the city is going to be destroyed. It seems like a pretty hopeless future. There's not much to put your hope in there. It's a promise of God, but not the kind of promise we want. But that wasn't all that Isaiah prophesied. Four chapters later, he gives those who were going to be taken into captivity 200 years later a promise that they could cling to. Isaiah 43, 1-3. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into captivity, knowing that God, the Holy One of Israel, their Savior, had already called them by name and redeemed them. And because of that, they knew they were secure. No flood could sweep them away. No fire could incinerate them. Nothing could separate them from the God who loved them. Do you have that confidence? Do you cling to that same promise? Our God is the same God. Our Savior, our Redeemer, who has called us by name and has even given his Son as a ransom for our sins so that in spite of fire or flood, we would be his forever. Romans 8.30, those whom God predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I have called you by name, and you are mine, and I will bring you to glory. Do you believe that? Because all this is a work of God in our lives. We can be sure, as Paul writes in verses 37 and 39 of Romans 8, that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, because secure in God's power and love, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, he went to the cross and faced the fire of God's wrath for us so we would never have to step into the ultimate fiery furnace. And because of that, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, we are fireproof through faith in Christ. The more assured we are of this, the more willing we will be to stand firm in our faith and not bend our knee and conform to the culture around us. Let's pray. Father, we have to confess that our faith is often weak. And like the man in Luke's gospel, Father, we, we need to pray. We believe. Help us to overcome our unbelief. Father, I pray that you would give everyone who is hearing this word this morning the gift of faith. That you would help everyone who's hearing this word Nurture their faith and fan it into flame, this gift that you've given to us. Reminding ourselves daily of the precious promises that are ours in Christ Jesus, who loved us and gave his life for us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.